Sure, you may have heard of folks calling for and celebrating the idea of Infrastructure Week across social media platforms, but what of a national infrastructure bank? Proposed into the last Congress, H.R. 6422 proposed the concept of an NIB or National Infrastructure Bank. What is it? What purpose would it serve? How might it complement the Biden administration's American Jobs Plan Act? Uh, what role might it play in job creation and addressing poverty in both urban and rural areas? That is what we'll seek to unpack here with the panel of presenters. Hello and welcome to the Jefferson Educational Society's Digital Programming. I'm Ben Spagan. I'm the Vice President at the JES and I'm a contributing editor at the Erie Reader. Now, before we dive into the presentation, a bit about the presenters. Alfeka Mutari serves as the Chief Economic Advisor to the Coalition for the National Infrastructure Bank. She's conducted macroeconomic assessments of the United States economy and publishes a monthly economic policy newsletter. She provided significant input into the design of House Bill HR 6422, the National Infrastructure Bank Act of 2020, introduced by Congressman Danny Davis in March 2020. Here in this discussion, she's going to elaborate uh, on the operation of the NIB and detail how this public bank will work to pay for all infrastructure projects. Felix Ortez uh, was a member of the New York State Assembly representing District 51 from 1995 to January 5th, 2021. Uh, from 2015, uh, or, or from uh, uh, and until 2015, he served as the uh, Assistant Speaker of the Assembly. Uh, his political experience includes being a member of the New York, uh, New York City Department of City Planning, uh, a member of the 72nd Precinct Community Council, and a Democratic District Leader for the 51st Assembly District. Uh, he's going to address how uh, the infrastructure needs of uh, urban and other areas compare uh, also how other nations actually build new infrastructure and how the United States must deploy the NIB to end these shortfalls. Uh, Representative Eddie uh, Pasinski was first elected to represent the 121st Legislative District of Pennsylvania, which consists of uh, Wilkes-Barre City, uh, Fairview Township, Wilkes-Barre Township, Ashley Borough, Hanover Township, and Laurel Run Borough in uh, 2006. He serves as the Democratic Chairman of the House Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee and also serves uh, currently as a board member of the Center for Rural PA and PA Hardwoods Development Council, as well as the chair of both uh, the Grandparents Raising Grandchildren and Legislative Sportsman Caucuses. Here, he's going to go through the infrastructure shortfalls besetting Pennsylvania and how the NIB will collaborate with the state to build all the projects, especially transportation. Uh, he'll also reference state and local resolutions uh, endorsing the federal legislation. Stanley Forzik uh, has over four decades of experience in transportation, energy planning, and management, uh, including uh, many years with Amtrak. He was the first director of uh, finance uh, for the Northeast Corridor, as well as the initial director for strategic planning. Uh, he owns his own consulting firm and is chairman of the advisory board of the Coalition for the National Infrastructure Bank. Uh, here, he's going to detail uh, plans to link Harrisburg, Pittsburgh, and Erie with high-speed and conventional passenger lines. Uh, he'll also outline the new jobs to be created in the Northwest Quadrant as a result of this massive investment program spearheaded uh, by the NIB. Folks, that was a quick reading of some tremendously talented and accomplished folks. I'm going to encourage you to head to our website, jeserie.org, to read their full bios to learn more about each one of our panelists. And of course, I want to say a special thanks uh, to someone we also have here with us for this program, uh, Erie City Councilwoman Liz Allen. Uh, I want to thank her and Margaret Taylor, uh, a citizen of Erie as well, for bringing this idea to the JES team uh, to help us explore this here in conversation. Uh, to hear about Erie's connection to this concept, we're going to hear from Miss Allen uh, during the Q&A portion of the program. Now, folks, since this is first airing live on the JES Facebook page, we're going to work our way through uh, as many questions from you, the viewers, as we can as we host this event. If you're watching or listening to a later broadcast of this event, still send us your questions, your comments to keep this conversation going and to stay engaged. And of course, for more information about upcoming JES programs and publications, please visit our website, jeserie.org. And be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Welcome, panelists, all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. For for joining us for this discussion. Alfaka, I'm going to turn things over to you. Let's hear your presentation, and then we'll hear a bit from each of the panelists, and then we'll dive into those questions uh, we have prepared here, as well as the ones we're going to take from the audience. So Alfaka, over to you, please. 
Thank you very much. And thanks to all of you uh, who are in attendance and uh, for having us. So I have a few slideshows uh, I'd like to bring up for you um, just to kind of explain to you how this national infrastructure bank concept works. Um, there we go. So the bill that we're talking about uh, today for you, and I'm gonna just move really quickly in case uh, my lawnmowers outside get too noisy. Uh, but the bill we're talking about is HR 6422, which was uh, a bill introduced into Congress last year by Rep. Danny Davis from Illinois with some other Democratic co-sponsors. Uh, and we're uh, looking to see if we can get it reintroduced into the current um, um, administration, into the current uh, session of Congress. Um, and we're also looking to see if we can get some Republican co-sponsors because in this, uh, in this uh, a period of time where infrastructure is really on the table to be discussed uh, um, by everyone and how we can pay for it, uh, this is a really good fit for, um, for everyone concerned. So actually this idea of a national infrastructure bank, you might be surprised to know, has been done successfully four times before in our nation's past. Uh, we had a first bank of the United States uh, after we, after our, our uh, after we won the Revolutionary War, which was uh, instituted by Alexander Hamilton, you know, that guy in the play, and uh, also George, President George Washington. And this bank financed infrastructure projects like roads, bridges, and canals, and our first industrial centers that started our Industrial Revolution. Then we had a second bank of the United States under two presidents, but expanded significantly under John Quincy Adams and built some more infrastructure. A third set of uh, banking, uh, a set of banks under Abraham Lincoln uh, financed things like the Transcontinental Railroad. And then a fourth really large bank called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation under FDR helped us to get out of the Great Depression and win World War II. So just a second while I move here, sorry for this. Um, the, uh, this iteration around, what we did was to ask ourselves the question, if we were not constrained by budgets in any way, uh, how much would we actually need to fix our country's infrastructure? And for that, uh, we went to the American Society of Civil Engineers who just came out with a new report card. And uh, what they said on this new report card, they gave grades to about 17 different categories of infrastructure. But importantly, they said that we need at least $6.1 trillion to fix everything over the next 10 year period. And uh, then they further estimated that maybe three and a half trillion is already uh, slated to be financed. And what do they mean by that? That means that uh, state and local governments uh, who put in three quarters of the money for infrastructure spending uh, would contribute their parts. And then the federal government would contribute the remaining one quarter of the money. So uh, to, because we now have a new proposal, which is President Biden's uh, infrastructure plan, which uh, he, he's calling the American Jobs Plan, uh, which proposes to spend two and a quarter trillion dollars over the next 10 year period. I've lined it up here so that you can see how it compares with the spending that's already slated to be funded. And essentially the Biden plan, which has about a little less than a trillion for infrastructure per se, fits within this pattern of infrastructure uh, financing that is already slated to be funded. So that means that the engineers estimate is correct that we will have $2.6 trillion completely unfunded by any means. And that has some whopping big numbers in it. For example, it has uh, 1.2 trillion for surface transportation. Uh, these are all the roads, bridges, and other projects that have not that have been sitting on the books for years and have not been able to be funded. Then uh, we also have 1.1 trillion dollars in there for water infrastructure. This is a huge new uh, number from the engineers, and it includes things like replacing all the lead line pipes, fixing stormwater overflows and uh, re re essentially redoing leaking uh, water systems. So we want this bank to, be cover, to cover all of those projects. And then in addition, uh, we want the bank to be able to uh, cover some expanded definitions, uh, which we've put in, which include uh, seven, uh, 700 billion for affordable housing, uh, $1 trillion for a high-speed rail 
across the United States, and then also um, uh, some other categories as well, and including broadband everywhere. So altogether, we want our new bank to roll out at $5 trillion large. So uh, this is essentially a quick rundown on how the bank works. If I can get my little arrow sign there. To, oh, come on. Sorry, I'm having trouble reaching my arrow <laughs> to go to the next slide. Okay, uh, this is a description of how the National Infrastructure Bank works. It is a public bank. It's incorporated under the U.S. Corporations Act, but it also acts just like a commercial bank. It uh, takes in deposits and then it gives out loans only for infrastructure projects. So in order to have a commercial bank like this, uh, you need to first capitalize the bank, get some uh, investors to put money into the bank. And instead of going to the federal budget to ask for money to uh, invest in the bank, we're going to the private sector and ask them, would they like to sell us some of their treasury holdings, which they're holding for long-term savings purposes. And they will exchange those treasury holdings for an equivalent of preferred stock in the bank. The preferred stock would pay an extra 2%, that's to entice these investors to bring their, um, their treasuries in. The 2% would initially be a stream coming off the federal budget, but then would be fully reimbursed back out of the interest earnings from the NIB's loans. That means that this NIB with respect to the federal budget is budget neutral, does not require any new taxes like a gas tax or anything like that, and does not create any new deficits or debts. It's completely budget neutral. This is a little flow right here, which explains how the bank would give out a loan. And it works just like any commercial bank does. Anytime anybody goes into a, a commercial bank for a loan, the bank puts the loan up on the asset side of its books and creates a deposit on the other side of its books, uh, which is a creation of new money. And the, this newly created money is the money that then supplies the cash for the loans. Uh, we think that this bank would charge uh, a very low rate of interest on its loans, maybe the treasury bond rate, which would keep financing costs for these infrastructure projects at uh, a very low um, level and would be very competitive with municipal bond rates as well. The borrowers would be state and local governments, so they can come in with a group of projects and then deflect the um, borrowing burden across several different balance sheets, for example, states, cities, counties for what they owe, uh, own as, as public infrastructure or utilities or transit authorities, those kinds of things. The projects would be the very same ones that we had on the previous uh, slide, roads, bridges, canals, airports, uh, the gr electric grid, all those kind of things would be covered by this bank. We know that there's great return to the economy for investing in infrastructure. For every dollar that one would invest, uh, that plows back three to seven dollars back into the economy. That will supercharge economic growth, and then that will provide new tax receipts back to the federal government and to state and local governments to pay back the loans. So when you spend five trillion dollars, you can imagine that you're going to be creating quite a, a number of new jobs, maybe up upwards of 25 million new great paying jobs. Uh, we'll be providing training for all of these new jobs, paying Davis-Bacon wages, which are union level wages. The, the, and any loan projects uh, that are financed by the bank must buy America only inputs going into the construction that will really stimulate new manufacturing growth in the United States. And the bank is oriented into doing um, community development and refurbishment uh, in poorer areas. That includes inner city areas and rural areas uh, to, uh, to really re refurbish their economies. And uh, we'll provide a lot of affordable housing and doing in the process. And then some of our sp other speakers are gonna talk to you about um, the example of high-speed rail and what that can do. So I'm um, going to go uh, give you a, uh, a kind of a snapshot of what this would look like on the ground. Since we're our host is um, very kindly been uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, I, I'm doing a little test case here for what's, what's in it for Erie, Pennsylvania from the NIB. 
Uh, so it's very, first of all, helpful to know that the state of Pennsylvania would, out of the $5 trillion made available, receive possibly upwards of $220 billion over a 10 year period to cover all of the state's infrastructure needs. And that would also create that um, construction and new financing would create over a, new mil a million new jobs in the state. Now, how about Erie, Pennsylvania's uh, uh, infrastructure needs? I was very su su pleasantly surprised to know that, they, that the city has a great new city uh, redevelopment plan, which uh, already lists the projects that they need, including roads, bridges, uh, some refurbishment of the power grid in the area. They have a, a bayfront uh, refurbishment plan to stimulate uh, um, tourism in the state, uh, that, which is also a big feature of their parks where uh, investments there would bring back dollars uh, in new business from tourism. Uh, they need some new work on their airports and their train stations. They have a port there with a, uh, um, a shipbuilding yard, which needs some dredging. Uh, they have some hazardous waste that needs cleaning up. And of course, like many areas, they need complete affordable broadband access everywhere. All of those projects would be fine, could be financed by the National Infrastructure Bank. And then uh, maybe uh, they need to do some investigation as to whether they have lead line pipes in the city that need replacing as well. So how about Erie's economy? Um, it, it's, this is really a, a, a case in point where uh, you have a city that's a gateway uh, to several areas and that just makes it a great place to invest in. Uh, Erie is the uh, primary access point of the state of Pennsylvania to Lake Erie and the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence Seaway. And then in addition, it hugs along the northern coast er coastal areas there that is a whole corridor of uh, economic activity um, along that um, lakefront area. So um, it, the city used to, of course, have large steel mills and other large manufacturing centers, which dwindled away as a lot of manufacturing went overseas. But now they have a really nice mix of mid-sized industries, smaller and agile steel plants and plastics plants, which would benefit from new uh, investment in the area and uh, a vibrant health insurance and tourism industries as well. So uh, all of these things would be really uh, helped and accentuated by investment in new rail projects. Uh, we envisage, this is a nice map of uh, how millennials see a new high-speed rail map across the United States. And if it's not covered by the pictures, what you'll see is that there's a rail line that goes stretching all the way from Los Angeles, California, through the entire country, skirting up along the side of, of uh, the corridor that Erie is a part of all the way up into New York state and building such a high speed rail and other passenger rail lines uh, will really furbish economic activity in the state. So that's about it for my presentation and I'll turn it over now to some of the other speakers to talk about how in investments can help New York, Pennsylvania and the whole uh, region as well uh, in the, and, and as well as the United States uh, uh, across the country. So thank you very much. Well, Fikram Tardy, thank you so much for, for that presentation and going through it. Uh, already, we've got a lot of questions uh, happening in the comments section, a lot of chatter as well. And folks have asked um, uh, for a link to that uh, presentation, which somebody from uh, the NIB coalition has been so kind to put a link to in the comments section. So for folks looking for a link to that presentation, you can snag that there. Uh, I'd like to go to uh, Assemblyman uh, Felix Ortez to give us uh, your perspective. Uh, we want to hear from you, sir, for a few minutes uh, before we move through our panelists and then get to those questions we're take from the audience. Well, thank you very much and thank you for having me. I think this is uh, this is that this is a wonderful step moving forward. I said, believe me, this is all common sense. Uh, I, re I used to represent the, the areas of Sunset Park Red Hook in uh, when uh, when I listened to the presentation about the connectors of the uh, uh, Speed Railroad and, and how we can move people around and also when was talk about the broadband, uh, brought me back to 1995 uh, when I began the conversation that uh, when I identified the Red Hook, for example, I'm gonna use Red Hook as an example, and then I jump to uh, my big picture of the national, international uh, experience uh, uh, going through all my career in the New York State Assembly and in politics as well. Uh, it's, it's, you know, Red Hook, uh, a very interesting community, uh, 12,000 people, living in that community, 45% Hispanic, 45% African-American, 10% Caucasian. And guess what? Only one bus line will go back and forth through Red Hook. I said, why we have Red Hook completely 
disconnected uh, to just about a mile away from Boro Hall or to the city. So I began to put a fight to have a train to be connector uh, to uh, from Red Hook to uh, downtown Brooklyn, which is Boro Hall. Uh, you know, still until today, we still haven't been successful on getting that. Uh, hopefully with this uh, National Infrastructure Bank, we might be able to get Red Hook connected finally into this. I use Red Hook as an example because this is in the city of New York, inside the city. And within inside the city, you also have Far Rockaway, who people have to walk miles in order to get a bus to move from that particular site to work in the city of New York or even in Brooklyn. So therefore, uh, the, uh, the speed railroad is a, is a very critical need for our country. Uh, when 1995, for the first time I went to China, uh, I began to see a lot of construction about connectors, connecting towns, connecting the Providence, connecting different municipality to the main uh, cities in order to avoid uh, migration to come from Fuyo, for example, to Xiamen. Uh, and the reason was that is because the government realized that was very critical to keep those people where they live, that they can work in, in, the, in the major city, but they can go back home at nighttime and then stay with their family. And, uh, and that will also avoid the overpopulation and the homelessness problem that we have in cities, in major city. So that was the concept back in 1995. So what I learned from here was that when I came back from China, I said to myself, well, what I gonna, how am I gonna use this experience to, ensure, to begin to motivate? And I, and I always, the, every time I went to China or I went to, uh, I went to Europe uh, and I began to see a lot of this uh, uh, project of infrastructure. And mainly the, I'm gonna concentrate on the speed roll, uh, railroad because I, that is the best example that we can see people being connected to stay in their home, go to work, and also help their own community to, uh, to enhance economically, economically. So when we talk about this particular National Infrastructure Bank, uh, my justification is very simple. We have to support them. How can we support this in a big way? Well, number one, I think we need to reach out to the National Hispanic Caucus State Legislator, have them involved, have them to do resolution, by organization, the National Conference State Legislator, they also need to be reached out to, and the National Black Caucus, and the National pa uh, Asian Pacific Organization, which I was a member of all of them, and I sat in the executive committee nationally, and we managed to do a lot of resolution on the bipartisan effort, because all these organizations are bipartisan. So when we talk about touching every state and territories, specifically the state, the 50 state, when we talk to the speed rail road, we do have it in our hands to connect ourselves. Some of us who have retired can be back connected to these legislators who continue to have this relationship and begin to build that consensus, that bridge amount, the state, state by state and have cities, counties to continue to introduce resolution calling upon the state legislator to pass the bill, but also to call into Congress. And furthermore, I would say that in order to continue to reemphasize uh, and push Congress, I think we need to do it in a way that we be able to also talk to the, to the National uh, Congressional Black Caucus and the National Hispanic Caucus to get them involved because it's a lot of, a lot of uh, discrimination. It's a lot of, uh, uh, if you will, ma ma marginalization and uh, when you talk about underserved community, for example, going back to broadband, Red Hook, Sunset Park, my community that I represent, COVID became to be the best example where people were saying, well, everybody have access to internet. Well, guess what? This is in the city of New York. This is not a, 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 a outside the city of New York where people have, probably don't have access to, by the way, they probably have better access to Wi-Fi that we do in the city. But the bottom line here, what I'm saying is that minority community always always been left behind. And I think it's very important to punch and to say that this $25 million and the 25 million jobs is going to benefit everyone throughout the country, including it's gonna be lift. It's gonna be lifting Hispanic, uh, uh, black and brown people that will be able to buy their home, to buy their vehicle at the end, but also to help to uh, continue to generate and help our economy. That is what we need to talk about as well. So but resolution per se, we need to use this group. We need to know how to use it. We need to use city council people to continue to push the uh, resolutions, uh, county legislators, as well as the state lawmakers. 
and this is going to take you to the finish line. And I and I will say that the prior speaker, uh, I, I I never get tired of listening to you because you are amazing. I have a great respect for you, uh, and you are very clear about pragmatically and objectively how you make your presentation and how we, the his, former legislator and legislator now, can use that to ensure that we be able to push uh, the Biden administration to the finish line. And we should not let the Biden administration hang the pumpkin. I think we need to put pressure. We cannot just go with what, whatever he proposed as we speak. It's a great start. We, 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 it's a good start. It's a good beginning. But guess what? It's a good beginning if we can complete it and then make it full and there will be a better beginning. But I think he's moving in the right direction. He's getting pressure from different angles, but I think the best pressure is gonna come when we really diverse, uh, bring the diversity of uh, to this particular uh, issue from all those communities that have been impacted and left behind. And COVID, my friends, had the biggest inequality in our country, and we know who the peoples are. So we need to take advantage of what happened with COVID can happen with infrastructure, with infrastructure can become too light and with the, the minority community will never benefit from it. So we have to make sure that we have a very good perspective on how we're moving forward. Assemblyman Ortiz, thank you for all of that. And I, I just want to echo two comments I'm seeing in the comment section right now. Number one, inclusion is definitely needed. And that person thanks you for that, for emphasizing this. Uh, and the minorities have been marginalized and we must address that. You talked about current uh, legislatures. Let's turn it over to Representative Eddie Pazinski. Uh, let's talk about some of the challenges that are besetting Pennsylvania and how uh, this collaborative effort uh, with the state to the federal, to the local is going to work uh, on these projects, uh, particularly in, in transportation. So uh, Representative, over to you, sir. Well, thank you very much, Ben. And uh, thanks to the councilman for his great observations. And of course, to Alfeca, who does a wonderful job of explaining this. For those of you that may be coming on for the first time, it may seem rather awesome when we're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars. But when you begin looking at the entire country, it really is something that is absolutely needed. And we are so far behind when you begin to realize that in Europe, they're spending double of what we're pro uh, projecting. And in China, we're only spending a third of what they are already uh, incorporating. Uh, my, my experience uh, started almost three years ago when Stu and his group came to my office in Harrisburg and began talking to me about the NIB. And I must be honest with you, I didn't quite understand it in the beginning, and it is massive, and there's still a great uh, many questions that I know all of you will have. There was a time when I thought, I don't know whether the trillions of dollars, whether we're going to be able to do this. But when you begin to look at history, and as Alfeca mentioned to you, four times in history, almost five when it comes to Eisenhower and the interstate, this system, NIB, was used in order to get the United States out of a financial hole. Hamilton used it to actually generate and start up a brand new country. After this pandemic, it has taught us a great deal of things and it's demonstrated how insecure we are when it comes to infrastructure of all different kinds. Now, Ben asked me to talk a little bit about Pennsylvania and the roads and so on and, and broadband. And because I sit on uh, the Centers for Rural Pennsylvania, broadband is key because we found out there is no education electronically in many parts of Pennsylvania, in many parts of the country. And as a result, those kids did not get the education. Well, what does that mean with the businesses? Well, if the businesses can't connect to high tech, that means those businesses in our Pennsylvania rural areas also can't compete. What about health? Telehealth, without the connection, those people in rural areas are not getting the kind of health services that they need and deserve. Pennsylvania has over 46,000 miles of roads. That's an enormous amount. And of those 46,000 miles, they have already estimated that about 42 to 43 percent are very deficient, some in poor condition. That's 18 to 20,000 miles of roadway that's not in good shape. The other thing that they talk about, we have a bazillion bridges. There's 46,000 of them that are structurally deficient. That means they're in poor condition. And guess what? 
the longer we wait, what happens? The more it costs. So yes, who would have ever expected we'd be talking about a project that's in the trillions when only a few years ago we thought billions and hundreds of billions of dollars was a lot of money. And it certainly is. But this investment is absolutely needed. There is no if, ands, or buts. I want to say, uh, I want to do a shout out to Representative Mary Jo Daly, Representative Joe Cerisi, Representative Ed Nielsen, who the four of us have been working on this project now for well over a year. We're definitely in. We bought into this. We just had a, um, a Microsoft Zoom meeting on Monday where we had over 75 of our colleagues and their staff become educated on this issue. We are now developing an NIB caucus. We are now planning trips throughout Pennsylvania to take the show on the road, so to speak, and begin to sell this, this incredible opportunity. If they could do it with Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, uh, President John Quincy Adams, Lincoln, and FDR, it's time now that we do it, and why? because we have a president that's actually trying to do it. His is a different plan. His actually is a tax on those, on those very high corporations from 21 to 28%, okay? Ours is different. Ours is not a tax. Our NIB program is private, uh, private investment backed by federal uh, treasuries. We can do this. Uh, I'm excited to be a part of it. I thank you for giving me the opportunity and uh, be happy to take any questions and uh, participate any way I can. Thanks, Ben. Representative, we, th we thank you for that. And, and as somebody who grew up in Southwestern rural Pennsylvania, I, I know that it takes time to get internet there uh, longer than it does in a, in a city. Uh, we're fortunate in Erie, but we know that there's still disparities here in the county when it comes to internet access. So uh, we know exactly what you're preaching and we appreciate that. I'm sure we're going to get to that in the comment section. Already a couple of comments asking uh, about high-speed rail, and, and we want to turn that over to transportation to Mr. Stanley uh, Forchek to take a look at uh, the plans to link Harrisburg, Pittsburgh, and Erie. Imagine being able to get from Erie, Pennsylvania to Harrisburg uh, on high-speed rail or convenient uh, passenger train. Uh, we know that we in Erie are the farthest municipal, farthest county away from our capital when it comes to the states. So those who represent us have to take the longest trek down there. Imagine if it's more quickly. Sir, tell us about the transportation initiatives underway. Uh, certainly, Ben, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak on the NIB and what, what it means to Pennsylvania and to uh, Erie itself. Let me just make a couple points here. Uh, I, I, I wanna tell everyone, don't concentrate on the money because trillions of dollars goes way beyond human comprehension uh, at, at our level. All right, you have to concentrate on what, it, what would the bank do and it would create a betterment for Pennsylvania and for the country. Don't just remember just a few years ago in the early 1900s to 1950, 1960, Pennsylvania was the industrial capital of the world, not just of the nation, but of the world. There were steel plants. There was all sorts of plants along the countryside and they were spilling out goods for everyone, everyone included, including this country and overseas. They were one of the first manufacturers out there for World War II supplies uh, that helped us win the war. Pennsylvania was also the home of the Pennsylvania Railroad, the world's greatest railroad, all right, up until the mid 1960s when it was going downhill. But rail and highway transportation is needed. That commerce is needed to keep people happy. Right now, if you look at the country, not everybody's happy. People are fighting all the time over simple little things that happen. So I think transportation, whether it be highway or rail, solidifies the country. I was looking at some statistics and I saw that Erie's population has been in decline for the last 10 years or so. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and that, that is really a shame because Erie, Pennsylvania is really the heart or the cog that, that helps East meet, meets West. In 1842, 
here we got the first charter for a railroad uh, line uh, within its confines. That's 180 years ago. And now you have the Lakeshore Limited and nothing else. It's very hard to get around uh, when you don't have good transportation. So you're losing people. You don't have uh, a decent rail system and things appear to be falling apart. And I think if we create the rail, if we create better highways, it will bring people back in. So let me just say this about rail, all right? About two months ago, I gave testimony uh, for folks in the, in the Pennsylvania Democratic Caucus. Uh, and if, if uh, you like, I can give you a copy of that testimony. But that testimony outlines where we need to take Pennsylvania. I was on the infrastructure takeover team uh, that uh, Amtrak had to take over all of the infrastructure from the bankrupt railroads in the, the mid to late 1970s. And I can tell you that a lot of the infrastructure uh, was falling apart and we took care of that, but a lot of the infrastructure became abandoned and could be used to set up different rail or commute, conventional rail systems throughout the country, uh, in particular, Pennsylvania. But let me just examine Pennsylvania from what I say is a triangle or a quadrangle uh, of service that can move people back and forth in the state. We have semi high speed rail out to Harrisburg from Philadelphia. From Harrisburg to Pittsburgh is not very good. And that's mainly because of the architecture that was used back in the late 1800s to put in the rail. Everybody's aware of the horseshoe curve and the stalling of trains out there. Everybody knows that the train moves very slow in those areas. The suggestion that was made in the, in the early 1990s, mid 1990s was to put in high speed rail from Harrisburg to Pittsburgh. That means you need a dedicated line away from the horseshoe curve, different architecture altogether. If you look at high speed rail lines, it's sort of like being on an airplane or on a highway. Everything banks into the curve. On a freight railroad, it banks the opposite way. And that's why the trains have to slow down. But the suggestion is dedicated lines from Harrisburg to Pittsburgh, which, is, which does have the same problem as Erie. There isn't a lot of commuter trains uh, or buses to do anything out of there. If we can build that high-speed rail system, then you could put in commuter rail outside of Pittsburgh and go through that region altogether. Then you can connect Pittsburgh to Erie so that the people of Erie have a way to meet their outside regions. Again, we want to increase the populace. We want to create a situation where the smaller businesses, where some of the plants in that area are refurbished and they begin to work and build the population back up again. So we wanna go Harrisburg to Pittsburgh, then Pittsburgh to Erie. Now, Amtrak has it already in its mind that it wants to put in rail, which, used, which the Pennsylvania Railroad used to, or Jersey Central used to have out to Scranton, Pennsylvania, but that was made defunct back in the uh, 1940s, 1950s. So now there is no train service, but Amtrak has suggested they're gonna bring it back. When they bring that back in the Scranton, the ideal situation would be to take and build commuter lines from Scranton to Easton, Bethlehem, Allentown, and either go to Harrisburg or out to Erie. And that would create the same situation that I just mentioned from Pittsburgh to Erie, which you would have different stations or different hub stations, and then you would have stations along the line. Now, some of those lines are abandoned, others are not. There has to be some regulation and some negotiations between the freight railroads so that we can change the architecture of that rail and make it more high speed than conventional trains. I'm not talking about 250 miles an hour. I'm not talking about 200 miles an hour. I'm talking about 90 miles an hour. 
because if we can get a train to go 90 miles an hour along, along the northern edge of Pennsylvania, then you can make that trip in a very short period of time. And eventually all of this would be hooked up with high-speed rail. And I think that's what's needed for Pennsylvania. Eastern Pennsylvania has the Northeast corridor of Amtrak and service is really good. Uh, you can get from Philadelphia into New York City and some of the stops in between in less than an hour. You can't drive that in an hour. The same is true, we would like to do the same thing on the Western portion, Pennsylvania to Erie, same type of service. And I think all those things are doable. The bank can get that done. At the same time, the bank is getting that transportation done. Then they're going to look to increase the populace in Erie. Uh, I like what Councilman Ortiz said about minorities, because I believe that uh, Erie right now, the majority of the folks living there are within the minority. I was also uh, struck by the fact that 28.5% of the people in Erie live at the poverty line or below. The rest of Pennsylvania, it's only 12%. So that will tell you that something has to be done in Erie. Let's talk about something else that rail will bring in. It will bring in workers. Alfeca mentioned the total amount of workers that would be brought in uh, to Pennsylvania, uh, to, to the Erie area and Pennsylvania. All right, there are rail schools. Amtrak has a school in Wilmington, Delaware, all right, where they do apprenticeship training and they do training for different skills that the railroad needs. There are other companies, larger companies that have satellite operations that could be part of the, of the growth of Erie and they have training programs and brought in. The NIB has been working with different craft unions on apprenticeship programs throughout the United States. And the same is true with them. They will bring together schools and apprenticeship programs so that workers will come back to your area, which I think is, and I'll, I'll leave this for uh, uh, Ms. Allen to talk about because she's on the city council. She probably will vote. I want to do that and I want to do that right away. But that's how things come back. It's done through rail, through highways to develop the commerce and the NIB will get that done and it will get it done to the extent that everybody will get the same. This is for the betterment of the country, not just Erie, not just Pennsylvania, but for the country. We want Pennsylvania, again, to be the industrial capital of the world, and we have to get there. And I'm sure Representative Koshimsi agrees with that, that that's what we have to do. So thank you very much. I'll answer any questions you have. Appreciate the time. Stanley, thank you. I think what people are saying right now in, in the comment section what they're thinking of is, is something that uh, was addressed and I think Liz can uh, uh, fact check me on this this was in the Rotoval plan in the 60s the 1960s of connecting Erie to Pittsburgh thinking of a mm -hmm. western Pennsylvania economic region and what better way to do that than with rail to be able to accessibly move quickly back and forth between the two cities and throughout the region. Uh, Liz, I want to welcome you into this conversation too. We've got plenty going on in the comment section, uh, folks weighing in. But Liz, you're the one that helped bring this to our uh, our digital stage to get this conversation going. So uh, what got you interested in this? And why does this make sense for folks in Erie to learn more about, become more interested in? Actually, it was citizen engagement. Margaret Taylor emailed me. She said, can you participate in the NIB webinar? And I did it. And I was so excited that I participated in the next one. I talked about it at city council and some of the city council people said, okay, Liz, you can be our point person on uh, you know, National Infrastructure Bank. And I thought, well, how am I going to explain all this? How am I gonna explain the history and the politics and the, and the economics of this. So I told um, uh, Stu, uh, who's involved in this conversation, not today, but who's been part of this, I said, Stu, we have a think tank in Erie. Let's bring it to the Jefferson Educational Society. And there was some joking back and forth between the Jeffersonians and the Hamiltonians. Ben Spagan jumped right in. 
I am so excited to hear all this. I got ideas. Um, Eddie, I hope, you know, you have the, we'll have an NIB caucus. Please come to Erie. I'd be happy to show you around now that I, you know, my husband and I are both uh, vaccinated. I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to show you around Erie. Um, Felix, talking about inclusion, we have the people in Erie, the groups in Erie, where we can take this program to get to build the momentum for this. Um, the mayor has um, a New Americans Council, um, a Black Affinity Group. We have. Um, we are going to be honoring Erie's Asian uh, Pacific community next month uh, through a resolution at, at Erie City Council. So we um, we have uh, all aboard Erie, which has advocated for higher speed rail, I think is the way we talk about now. So it's not the, you know, the bullet trains, but we know get them, get them faster here. So we can share this program. This is all your ideas, Alfeca, with, with everything that you gave, um, which now I've heard for three times, you're making it easier and easier for me to grasp. Um, you know, we'd like to do a resolution for, I'd like to for city council, but now I can say, look, this is where you can go and you, in an hour, you can get the basics on this and we can um, get other advocates to come on board. The words you're speaking about the importance of inclusion, Erie's industrial history, being able to feel like we're part of the rest of Pennsylvania. I live in Erie, I'm the oldest of six. I have one sister in Maryland, I have a son in Maryland, but I have a sibling in Punxsutawney. I have two brothers in Harrisburg and a sister in Philadelphia. So I certainly know about the challenges of getting from Erie to elsewhere. And I was also um, on a board in Harrisburg that um, met five times a year. Although actually I was the one who always showed up despite the snow. So thank you so much. I don't wanna monopolize the time, but you gave me a lot of ideas now about how to um, educate people and get them excited. So I'm excited. Liz, thanks, uh, man, the, thanks everybody. The energy is palpable and I appreciate that. And, and it is in the comment section too. A few folks uh, have noted and our panelists have noted as well that Alfaca is a great presenter and we're appreciative of that information. So there's sort of several rounds of applause in there for everyone. Uh, but I wanted to point that out and go back to that as well. And, and I think this is one of the things folks are picking up on too. Uh, uh, that Assemblyman Ortiz, you mentioned, you know, your trip to China was in, in 1995, 1995, that's quite a long time ago to be thinking about how quickly they're moving as a country toward infrastructure and how slowly we might be. And, and folks are noticing the lag uh, that the U.S. is behind when it comes to transportation and also broadband. And, and granted, it's been two years since I've looked into the data, but the U.S. barely cracked the top 10 when it came to broadband access. We were outpaced by European countries and Asian countries as well, Norway and, and South Korea up there at the top in terms of access to high-speed internet. And we were down toward the bottom of those top 10, uh, which is alarming, I think, to say the least. A lot of folks, Alfeca, I want to go to you first, are wondering, uh, because we've used the historical examples of this is not new, we've had these banks before, but they've gone away. Why did they go away? And how do we bring them back? Because I think some people are concerned that we see that because they've gone away, they don't work or that they could have been failures. So why have these banks gone away in the past? All four of the banks that I mentioned in the past, with the exception of uh, the Lincoln banks, uh, had a sunset clause in their statute. Um, they were only meant to last for 20 years and then they expired and the Congress did not reinstate them that became a little bit of a foot, political football at the time. But that's not to, uh, it, was, it, it was more a, a political objection than anything else. In terms of their operation, they did what they were advertised to do. At a period when we couldn't afford to finance infrastructure through federal budgets, these banks came in and financed the infrastructure for us. They all got paid back. They were loans, not spending. They all got paid back and they ended their uh, statutes, their terms in the black. Um, the, the current iteration or the current proposal does not have a sunset clause in it. We think we really need a permanent institution to, to take care of financing infrastructure over the long haul because infrastructure is something that needs a dedicated long-term stream, a dedicated stream that you can count on to make sure that there's a follow through on infrastructure investment. So for that reason, we haven't put a sunset clause in and we are very confident that this bank will operate just like those previous banks and will be, um, will, um, uh, be very effective at not only building infrastructure, but really 
basically reformulating the American economy and improving the workforce and, and the, the job market for American workers as well. Thank you for that, uh, Alfeca. And, and I want to take a question from the audience here and, and take a look to our uh, uh, two elected representatives on, on, on the panel here um, uh, in two different states, uh, New York and Pennsylvania. But this person is asking what negatives will elected officials, the Fed, at the federal level, at the state level, uh, bring forth against this proposal? What is the counter narrative? And, and, and if I can start with you, uh, Assemblyman uh, Ortiz, you, you had touched a bit about working with the current administration, but in your experience, what do you see the counter argument being from elected officials of why such a thing, a national infrastructure bank, would not work? And then we'll go to uh, Representative uh, Pazinski after. So, uh, Felix, can we start with you? It's one, one, one of the one of the uh, of the uh, probably uh, negative uh, or opposition uh, to it is uh, sometimes is depending on on the leadership uh, where the leadership is sitting and where the where the leadership is really moving uh, and in which direction. As we all know, you know, in New York two years ago, uh, when uh, Stewart brought this uh, issue to my attention when I was elected, I didn't blink uh, at, at all. I, I, I listened very carefully and I was the first legislator, I do believe, around the country uh, who introduced the first resolution uh, calling on Congress to uh, support the, the National mm -hmm. Infrastructure Bank, if I remember correctly. Uh, and, uh, and, my, and my leadership uh, came over and said, we, 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 you know, we thank you very much for introducing this, but we cannot move this uh, in our state legislature uh, because we don't want to impose into Congress. Now, saying that, uh, I can also uh, say that uh, my success uh, on continue to push in this, this particular resolution, uh, uh, although never passed the Assembly and the Senate, but I managed to have a Senate sponsor as well. Uh, we held numerous uh, uh, amount of conference, uh, com press conferences to make our legislators to understand why this particular resolution is so important when it, we come to infrastructure. And I'm going to go back to something that I say about Red Hook, for example, 45% Black, 45% Hispanic. Uh, and every single one of us uh, began to uh, narrow down uh, the community that has been impacted and been neglected by government for uh, centuries and uh, and when you have when you're talking about urban and rural, you know this is not a <laughs> Red Hook is not a rural area; it's an urban area. <laughs> so you're talking it's next to the city of New York, across the street from the financial district, and doesn't have access to internet. Uh, at Sunday happened, and we don't have no phone lines. We don't have no access to cell phone. Therefore, we had to put towers outside on the BQE in order to supply to Red Hook, which which as some is across the street, but slow is across the street. They all have Wi-Fi and they all have the, old, the best services. So using this as an example, you know, uh, I managed to continue to push the issue and to call in Congress. Now, lastly, one of the best mechanisms to really get legislators' attention and I'm talking about state legislators, Senate and Assembly, is to have to work together with county leg legislators who are really aggressive enough in this issue, and with city council people who are willing to step to the plate to call on the state legislator by they submitting resolution, calling on the state legislature to support their own resolution, even though they're, they're calling on Congress as well. And and that that uh, that is where we have to really concentrate is on the leadership of every. Uh, assembly and Senate, who run the city, the assembly, who run the, the, the Senate, and those are the individuals that really, uh, you know, we have to target, uh, plain blank. They have to be part of the, of the, of the equation, and whether or not uh, is, uh, is mandated by administrative rule within the assembly and the Senate that we don't call on Congress, uh, you know, that's complete BS. I think we have to, we, we need to let the legislator to be who they are, uh, let's bring it to the floor, and let's have legislators to vote on the resolution and move it forward. I have been through those experiences in the past. I've been very successful on having some of them pass. Some of them have been held by the speaker, not by the by the other members, just the speaker, because he doesn't want to really antagonize Congress. But this is not about antagonizing Congress. I think we're putting Congress to work. 
Representative Ortiz, I appreciate that. Thank you. I, I want to go to uh, Representative Pazinski. Uh, Representative, do we still have you here? We're, we're, same question yes. to you. What, what, what is the counter argument and how do we work through that for uh, elected reps who are going to say this isn't a good idea, this isn't something we want to support? What are you, what are you hearing counter argument? Well, that's a, that's a great question. And uh, it goes something like this. First, they have to understand it. And generally, uh, you need to be uh, participating in this presentation several times before you're able to get all your questions answered. But what Councilman uh, Ortiz had mentioned is something that we're trying to do now as the caucus. And that is, we wanna reach out to every one of our 203 state legislators, ask them to get on board, ask them to go to their community, their municipality, their county, and ask those municipalities and counties to support it with a resolution. We then follow up with a resolution from the state. Now, I believe Alfeca might be able to clarify this a little bit uh, more clearly than I can. When we talk about Davis-Bacon, we're talking basically union, do, union uh, wages. And sometimes some folks get a little bit um, concerned about that because they, they, they can't see the benefit of the union wage as opposed to a private contractor. Uh, private contractors are going to be involved in this. This is not just uh, you know, union contractors. Uh, and, the, and the point that, that comes back here is that every one of those union wage jobs, that's money that comes back into the economy, which purchases American products and goods. And Alfeca mentioned before, all the materials, whether it's the steel, whether it's the concrete, which it's by American. I mean, a lot of businesses and manufacturers are gonna benefit from this. So at this point, I think it's political. Uh, some, uh, some people don't wanna support it because it's not their idea. And we try to say to them, listen, it's not our idea. It's called an American idea. We wanna do this for the betterment of America and, and all Americans. I hope I answered your question. I think there's a comment in there that speaks right to that of we've gone from common sense to partisan. And I think that people are recognizing that that is one of the biggest roadblocks, pun fully intended, uh, to developing infrastructure here. And in, in trying to work across the aisle is going to be one of the biggest challenges uh, to get to see people to, to see this not as a political issue, but one for actually rebuilding our country. And speaking of rebuilding, uh, Stanley, I want to go to you for an audience question here. Uh, looking at building new infrastructure versus improving current infrastructure in this person's wondering uh, from the audience, uh, is it more cost effective to work with what we already have and improve it? Or are we looking at a whole new build to get us up to speed? Do we have to uh, start over blank canvas to catch up? Or can we build on our current infrastructure when we're looking at places like Pennsylvania and, and, and maybe to your Amtrak experience? Well, I, I, I think I, that's a really good question. And the way I would answer it would be this. It's really a combination of both. When you, when I first came up to uh, Pennsylvania, I'm originally from North Jersey, and then I went to Washington, and then came up to the operations center with Amtrak in Philadelphia. Since about the 19 late 1960s, 1970s, and you see this not only in the Philadelphia area but other areas where there's manufacturing plants that are just standing there. Uh, there's thousands of them across. Uh, the state of Pennsylvania. Now, some of them are not that deteriorated. Some of them uh, are workable. So I think when we talk about infrastructure, it depends on what's going to be developed. There are portions of Pennsylvania where uh, buildings and other portions of infrastructure are good enough to just do it. Maybe they just need to be brought up to date with better technology, or we have to build new. In the case of railroads, Okay, where Amtrak and maybe commuter agencies or authorities that are set up are going to use freight lines. All right. The idea is, as I mentioned in my conversation, was simply the architecture of the tracks are not conducive for utilizing that for passengers. So there's got to be some change, but that just means you change the architecture. You can still use the roadbed, you can mm -hmm. still use the rail, you might substitute concrete ties for wood ties. But it's basically going to be the same thing. You're just switching the architecture from leaning on one side to leaning on the other side. So, and I think that's true for, for every business, just like it is for every highway. You don't rebuild a highway. You've got, you've got stuff that is underneath the ground. The foundation is underneath the ground. You're going to use that. You just might resurface it. You might put in curbs. 
uh, and put in new rebar for the jug handles and different things like that. So everything's got to be looked at and focused on individually. So I would say you're going to do both. That's the short answer. Stanley, I appreciate that. And we are almost out of time. I'm going to read uh, just a couple of comments from the comment section. One says, amen, we love American ideas. Another says, thank you to all the panelists for their excellent presentations. I can't uh, echo that enough. Thank you all for taking the time, energy, and effort to do this and be here with us. As, as we wrap up, uh, Alfek, I'm going to come back to you. You got us started. Uh, for somebody who's listening or watching, and uh, there's so much that we talked about and packed into this presentation, and folks are asking for uh, your slide deck, which we've got available in the comment section. People can snag that on the JES Facebook page. Uh, but if somebody's going to take something away with them, and they're going to think about it tonight, and they're going to wake up tomorrow morning, and then it's still in their head, what do you hope the one thing that they take away from this is that they hold with them tomorrow as they move forward? Alfeca, to you. Investing in infrastructure is great for everybody. It, everybody's a winner out of this. Not only do we have new refurbished infrastructure, but we have great paying jobs as well. If you want to have more um, materials, uh, uh, you can go to our website. Um, we have uh, some of the uh, informational packages there, which can help you to understand how this NIB works. And what our, it's really important to just keep in mind what our needs are. We have gotten into a backlog now and we really have a large job, but everything that's a large job and a large uh, emergency is also a large opportunity. And this is a great opportunity to refurbish uh, the American workforce, to refurbish the American economy and really get ourselves back on track again. And really connect the country, transportation, broadband, so many good things to unpack here and continue that conversation. Panelists, one and all, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, your time, your experience, your expertise with us here in conversation on the digital stage. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And of course, a big thanks to uh, Liz Allen for bringing this program to our attention. But thank you also to Margaret Taylor for bringing this to Liz Allen's attention so we can have this conversation here uh, and engage all of you. And of course, all of you watching along at home, whether you're tuned in in real time to the JES Facebook page, watching live, or you're catching a later broadcast of this streaming it on demand thank you thank you thank you without you these programs don't happen uh folks a friendly reminder to stream other jes digital programs on demand head over to our website jeserie.org there you're going to find details also about upcoming programs as well as a wide range of publications from quick timely reads to reports to essays and more all available free to download and of course be sure to like us on facebook follow us on twitter and instagram and subscribe to our youtube channel for the jefferson educational society i'm ben spagan be safe be sound and thanks for listening and learning with us Yes.